Uh, so Rusty said, most of the things I normally say on this uh, slide. Uh, so maybe I'll just say, I don't know if any of you are Monty Python fans, but this is sort of time for something completely different uh, than what you've been hearing about the last couple days. Uh, so I'll be telling you about Chapel. The subtitle of my talk here is Productive Multi-Resolution Parallel Programming, which maybe doesn't mean a lot to you now, uh, but hopefully by the end of the talk it will. Um, and I'll just mention that, so this is about an hour-long talk here. Um, you should feel free to interrupt me with questions because I tend to fill every minute, and if you don't break in while I'm talking, then you may just not have time at the end. Um, but I'll also mention that we have a hands-on session this evening, and as I understand it, Chapel will be one of the three technologies that you can try tonight. Uh, so that'll be another chance to dig into it a little bit more deeply than we have in this hour. Uh, so with that, I'll get started. This is a slide my lawyers make me put in, which say you can't predict the stock price based on anything that you're going to hear today, which is probably true. Uh, but let's talk about, so why are we doing Chapel? Again, Chapel is a new language we're developing. And our motivation for Chapel is sort of this question. Can we design a language uh, for HPC specifically, but also maybe more general for people wanting to do parallel programming that says productive as Python, as fast as Fortran, as portable as C, as scalable as MPI, and then the last one here is as fun as kind of, you know, remember when you first started programming and you thought, wow, this is really fun. Um, many of us in HPC don't feel that way on a day-to-day -day basis. It's more like something we have to do. And wouldn't it be great if, you know, programming in HPC could be as rewarding as those first times that you were, you were writing program, right? Uh, so our answer to this question is we believe that you can create uh, such uh, a language. Um, and then I, I usually, for these talks, put up some fake titles for my talk as well. So one of my fake titles is uh, Chapel putting the Wii back in HPC, um, trying to make HPC uh, something exciting and fun and not just kind of something you have to slog through as a programmer. Um, so then the question is, if, if I think we can have such languages, why don't we have such languages today? And um, a reasonable thing that people might guess the answer to that is, uh, well, maybe there are technical challenges, right? Maybe this is, is really, really hard. And I think there are technical challenges, but I don't think this is the showstopper. Uh, I don't think this is why we don't have such languages today. And I think the real reason is that as a community, in the HPC community, we've had a distinct lack of long-term efforts, of uh, sufficient resources to develop such languages, of the community willpower to develop such languages, of opportunities for co-design between language developers and end users uh, to create something that would make sense for both parties and patience, right? Uh, in parallel computing, we're by nature an impatient people. We want things to run fast, and we want them now. Uh, so when that new machine comes out, uh, we just want to run on it. We're not necessarily willing to invest for a long time sometimes. Uh, so this is why I think we don't have a language as attractive as the one I, I tried to illustrate in the previous slide today. And uh, in a nutshell, Chapel is our attempt to reverse this trend. Um, and so this takes me to my second uh, joke title for the talk, which is, putting the we, like us, back in the HPC. And what I mean there is, um, I think a lot of people, particularly younger in their careers, which I think of a lot of you as being, sort of imagine that HPC is this vast community and there's nothing we can do to change it, and things like, you know, you're gonna use MPI or CUDA or whatever, sort of handed down from on high. And while we are a large uh, community, and if you go to supercomputing, you'll, you'll see that firsthand, the fact of the matter is we're not so large that it isn't possible for a group of people like the size of the people in this room to make a really profound difference. And I think for us to create a language like Chapel and have it be successful, it's necessary for you know, more than just my team to be interested in it and more than my team to care about it and, and put things into it. Uh, so what I encourage people is, if you like what you see today, um, don't sit back and go, that's great. You know, when are you going to be done with it? And think about it more as like, what can I be doing to sort of move this open source effort ahead, whether that's um, just telling more people about it, whether that's uh, kicking the tires as a user and giving us feedback on what works or doesn't work well, or whether that's contributing back to the code. Okay? All right, so let's get into the actual content here. Um, what is Chapel? Again, I've already alluded to the fact it's a parallel programming language. It's designed for productivity. Um, a bunch of kind of one bullet things to describe it. It's extensible, it's portable, it's open source, it's collaborative, uh, and it's a work in progress. And time permitting, I've got some slides at the end that go into each of those bullets in a bit more detail. Um, but that sort of gives you a sense of, of what we're trying to build here. And the two main goals for Chapel are to support general parallel programming, which I think of as being, you know, if you have some parallel algorithm in mind and some parallel hardware, you ought to be able to use Chapel to write that algorithm and run it on that hardware. And if not, we've failed in this goal. Uh, and the second goal is, uh, as we've already talked about, to make parallel programming far more productive. Now, this word 
productive or productivity is a really loaded term. Because if I asked each one of you what it meant, I'd probably get a variety of different answers. Um, so I'll tell you kind of the way I tend to break down the, the answers that I hear when I ask people, you know, what does productivity mean to you? And if I talk to uh, recent graduates, um, people coming out of maybe their bachelor's or even a graduate degree, and say, you know, what, what does productivity mean to you as, as far as programming languages go? Often I'll get a response like, um, you know, well, something like what I learned in school, you know, Python or MATLAB or Java, depending on what their background is. Uh, and if you talk to seasoned HPC programmers, the answer you often get is, well, productivity is that sugary stuff that I don't need because I was born to suffer. Like, it's my, my job in life just to, like, do whatever it takes to get the performance. I'm used to using MPI plus OpenMP plus CUDA or whatever. Uh, and this is obviously a tongue-in-cheek uh, answer. What they're usually really saying is, I need full control over my program so that I can ensure performance, right? I need to get every flop out of this, and I'm not willing to give anything up. And this relates to a misconception I think we have that if you introduce higher level features or mo more programmable features, you're necessarily giving up performance. And while that's often the case, and object-oriented programming I think is a good, a good example of that, I think well-designed abstractions don't necessarily uh, force you to give up performance. So I don't think these two things are uh, intrinsically at odds with one another. And then finally, if we talk to computational scientists, say physicists, chemists, um, whatever, uh, you know, what do they want? Often what they say is, you know, I, like I understand parallelism and I'm happy to write parallel computations. I just don't want to have to wrestle with a lot of architecture specific details, right? I don't want to have to rewrite my code when a new system comes online or a new processor type comes out, things like that. And that's understandable, right? They want to focus on their science, not on computer science. So the Chapel team's answer to what productivity means to us is a combination of these three things. We want to design a language that lets the computational scientists express what they want at the science level uh, without taking away that finer grain control that an HPC programmer would want or need and implement it in a language that's attractive enough uh, that a recent graduate would find it appealing. Okay, so over the course of the talk, you'll see the language and you can tell me whether or not I'm succeeding based on where you fit in the spectrum. Um, before I start describing Chapel, I'd like to start with uh, a little bit more motivation. And I'm going to give you sort of the easiest parallel programming problem there is, pretty much. Um, this is a simple benchmark called Stream Triad. Uh, basically, we're just going to do a scalar multiply of a scalar alpha, shown at the bottom of the slide, times a vector c, add it to another vector b, add it, uh, assign it to the first vector a. And this is clearly sort of a trivial, embarrassingly parallel problem. Um, if we wanted to parallelize it, we could chunk the vectors up. Uh, have each thread or task do a sub-chunk of the vectors, uh, and we'd have a parallel program. And if we, this is sort of my shared memory view, because there's one alpha shared between all my tasks. In a distributed memory world, uh, we might uh, chunk it up and, and replicate the alpha so that everyone has their own copy. So this is my cartoon for distributed memory. And then, of course, the world we're living in today is typically a hybrid of these things, where we have uh, distributed nodes, each one of which has shared memory, so you have both the distributed and shared memory parallelism. All right, so again, sort of simplest program you can imagine. It's got parallelism. It's got sort of locality awareness. We want all those vectors to be uh, distributed in a similar way. Uh, so it should be really trivial to write. And it's not too bad. Um, this is that code in MPI, C plus MPI. Uh, the computation I wanted to do, the vector scale add, is the little green loop down in the bottom right. Uh, the red code is the MPI code. And there's not that much of it because it's embarrassingly parallel. So it's basically just set up and tear down. And the rest of it is just kind of C boilerplate in black. OK, so again, not, not too bad. Uh, if I then wanted to do the hybrid version and I wanted to use OpenMP to do that hybrid computing, uh, then I'd add this blue code, uh, which says, uh, let me mark these loops as being parallelizable. And then I'll get uh, multi-threading uh, being used to implement those loops. Uh, so again, not too bad and not too hard, as you'd expect. But I think the really unfortunate thing here is, again, completely trivial program. We want to talk about parallels, and we want to talk about locality. And these two programming models require us to do that using completely different abstractions, completely different concepts, completely different uh, syntax. And that's unfortunate. And then if we throw GPUs into the mix and uh, we write a CUDA version, the CUDA version is over here in purple. Um, again, uh, completely different concepts, syntax, abstractions. And it only gets worse as we go from this very, very simplest uh, computation to actual real science that you might want to do, right? Uh, so this is what people often refer to as like the alphabet soup of HPC, where you're sort of mixing and matching these different notations together. Um, and, and my sort of statement here is that I think HPC as a community, um, we as programmers, suffer from having too many distinct notations for talking about the two key things, parallelism, which is what should run simultaneously, and locality, where should it run? So a fair question to ask would be, well, how do we get to this state? 
And I think it relates back to that impatience that I mentioned before. Um, in HPC, I think we tend to build these, these systems, these fast systems, and then we want to program them, and we approach them from a bottom-up perspective, which is completely reasonable. Uh, we say, you know, this system has these capabilities. What software do I need to access those capabilities? Um, and then I, I can now run on the machine, and I can get the performance I need. And then we sort of stop. We never kind of keep going bottom-up until we get to higher-level abstractions. So when it gets things like um, portability, generality, programmability, usually we're willing to throw some of that away at some point. And that's not to say that we don't have any portability, but again, you know, why are we not using MPI and GPUs? Well, it wasn't designed for that, right? Um, so where we end up with, with this table, where on the left column I have uh, different types of hardware parallelism you might want to target. Cross-node parallelism, intranode parallelism, vector parallelism, so on and so forth. In the middle I have some of the programming models that in practice we use to uh, access that hardware. And again, it's sort of different models for different uh, pieces of hardware, typically. And on the right, I've got different units of software parallelism, right? So is, is our unit of parallelism the executable, uh, like an SPMD model, or is it like an iteration of a loop? And so the point here is if you want to target multiple types of hardware parallelism or uh, uh, implement multiple styles of software parallelism, typically you find yourself mixing and matching these program models. And again, that, that works, but it seems unfortunate to me. Uh, so there's some benefits to this model. Uh, we have a lot of control, decent generality. If the, if the machine can do it, we can do it. Um, these are typically reasonably easy to implement models. That's not to say they're trivial, but because they're lower level, they're close to the machine, there's not as much software to be written to, to get them working. Um, the downsides, though, are that the user ends up managing a lot of detail, and the code tends to be fairly brittle to changes. And that could either be changes in the algorithm, like you want to change from a 2D to a 3D algorithm, say, or changes in the architecture. All right, so if we go back to this slide, I said HPC suffers from too many different ways of talking about parallelism locality. Um, if I were really uh, completely honest with you, I'd say, so let's just stop. But of course, being a language person, I'm going to throw in one more language, right? Let's use Chapel. Uh, but the key is I'm not saying let's use Chapel and all these other things. I'm saying let's just, let's just try using Chapel. Um, so this is the stream triad code in Chapel. And you'll see it's, I haven't left anything out here. This is the full program. So you'll see it's much shorter than the other codes we were looking at, and that's just by virtue of the fact that it's a more modern, higher level language. Um, but the other thing that's interesting about it is that this one code could be run serially, shared memory, distributed memory, that hybrid shared distributed memory. It could run on an accelerator. Uh, it's, it's designed in a way that's very, very independent of how uh, it's mapped to the architecture and what kind of architecture it runs on. And the key there is this demapped clause, which I have alighted one expression from, but there's, it's really one expression. And this clause says, how should I map this computation down to the system? And if I want to change the system or change the mapping, I can change that one clause. And all of the science, which in this case is like the vector multiply add, um, remains independent of, of that change. Uh, it, it just sort of follows along with that change. So over the course of my talk, I'm going to kind of build up to this. And by the end of the talk, you'll understand all these concepts. But for now, I'm just going to sort of throw it at you and move on. Um, but the philosophy here is that uh, with a top-down language design like Chapels, where we say, we want to talk about parallelism. We want to talk about locality. We want to talk about how to map that to the machine. And then we'll worry about all the details of how do we map it to all the different architecture types. We think we can come up with a much better language that teases all these important details into the, the separate camps where they ought to be, where the algorithm person can work on the algorithm, the HPC person can work on the HPC things, the compiler and the runtime can work on things that they can handle, and uh, hopefully we'll all be happy. That's the vision. All right. Uh, so I've just given you some motivation for Chapel. Um, next, I'm going to give you a quick survey of Chapel concepts. And this, this will be kind of a, a brief tour of the language. Um, in an hour, uh, I can't give you a full detailed description of language. Um, a full day is a better amount of time for that, or two days even. Uh, but for now, I'll give you sort of a, a flavor, and hopefully you'll know enough to kind of be dangerous with Chapel as you leave the room. Um, and before I actually start showing you features, let me define one of the terms that was in my title, this term multi-resolution, which we don't often use in, in programming language contexts. Um, so what we mean by this is, uh, in the past, there have been other high-level languages. And the problem that many of them have had is that when their abstractions work for you, you're happy. And when they don't work, you're sort of stranded, you know, far away from the machine with kind of no recourse. And the thing we did with Chapel was we said, well, we want these high-level features, but we want a way to get down closer to the machine when necessary. So if those high-level abstractions fail you, either because they tie your hands in a way you don't like, or maybe you're not getting the performance you would want, you can drop down to lower levels and get closer to the machine as necessary. 
Um, and so the idea was uh, to build this language that was, had multiple tiers to it, some of which were higher level, some of which were lower level, and in which you could sort of move between levels from one function or statement to the next. Uh, and not only that, but the highest levels of the language here are actually implemented in terms of the lower levels, and that guarantees that they'll all interoperate well and, and cooperate. So you as a user can write these highest levels, things like you could write your own array distribution, for example. And again, that's something we'll build up to over the course of the talk. Uh, so I'm going to use this sort of conceptual stack of features as kind of my roadmap as I'm walking you through the language. And I'll start out with the lower three tiers of the language, which we call lower level chapel, although it's still quite high level compared to <clears throat> you know, C or P threads or something like that. Um, and specifically, I'll start with the base language. And you can think of the base language as being, uh, if you took chapel and you ripped out every feature related to parallelism and every feature related to scalability, the base language is what you'd be left with. So you can think of it as like the serial C or Java or Fortran on which Chapel's based, except that rather than basing it on any of those languages, we started from a blank slate, although we did take a lot of influences from other languages, of course. Um, so I'm going to show you an example and just kind of point out some features as I go. Uh, this is an example that implements a Fibonacci iterator and does a little loop over it printing out the numbers. Um, so uh, over here on the left, you can see the Fibonacci iterator itself. Uh, this is what we call clue-style iterators, which is one of the first languages that have these. If you're a Python programmer, you probably think of it more as like a Python generator. If you're not familiar with either one of those concepts, it's a lot like a normal function or procedure, except that rather than returning a single time, you've got this yield statement which says, kick a value back to the call site, but then logically continue executing. So when I invoke it in a loop, uh, as over here on the right, uh, you can see for f in fib of n, I'm basically saying uh, to this iterator, uh, you know, give me n values, and then as the iterator falls out, as it returns, then I sort of exit the loop. Uh, and then in the, the black console here, you can see the output, which would be the, the first few Fibonacci numbers coming out. Okay, so, uh, you know, we think these iterators are really nice. Um, we think every language should have them. Uh, we've got them. Another thing you'll see over here on the right is this thing called a configuration constant. Um, a lot of our declaration styles have the ability to have this config put on front of them, and this gives you sort of automatic command line parsing of that variable. So here you can see I'm initializing in the code the variable to, be, uh, to have the value 10, so I'll get 10 Fibonacci numbers when I run it. Um, but because I put that config there, when I run the program, as you can see up in the blue box at the top, I can override that default and say, well, let's make n equal to a million, for example. And, uh, and uh, so then I'll get a million Fibonacci numbers out. So the goal here is kind of, hopefully you'll never have to write command line parsing, argument parsing again, or at least you know, only in very extreme situations. Um, another thing that uh, hopefully is, is sort of very obvious is that I haven't declared the types of my variables, my arguments, the return type of my iterator. Um, and you can do all of these things. So I could say n is an integer, current is an integer, next is an integer. Um, but we also allow the compiler to infer it. Um, so it's very important to point out that unlike a scripting language like a Python or MATLAB, uh, the compiler is still figuring out statically what the types of all these expressions are. So you're not, we're not paying any execution time cost for dynamic typing or trying to determine what the types are. And we don't run into any of the safety issues that dynamic typing gives you either. Um, it's just a convenience mechanism where, you know, I'm passing an integer into this thing. The compiler should be able to figure out it's taking an integer. Why do I need to tell it? Um, so that's one side of the argument. Of course, the other side is that uh, specifying the types of things helps with documentation and keeps your interfaces uh, really firm and things. And of course, you can declare types if you want to. Um, here I'm just showing that you can also leave them out. So when you do leave them out, the compiler basically says things like, I see that n is initialized with 10. I know that 10 is an integer, therefore I know n is an integer. I see n is being passed to Fibonacci, which has an uh, argument named n. I know that that formal argument must be an integer. I can then flow through and see that current and next are integers, and I'm yielding current, so this thing's yielding integers, so f is an integer back on the right. And it basically just follows your uh, flow of your program, figuring out what the types are. Um, again, you could also assert all of those types in the code, or some of them and not others. Uh, in my slides, I usually leave the types out, both to kind of show it off and because it takes up less space. Uh, so the next thing I'm going to do is change my invocation of Fibonacci a little bit. I'm going to throw in the zip keyword. This is a pretty important keyword in Chapel. This basically says iterate over multiple things simultaneously, uh, such that the, uh, the um, corresponding iterations line up. So here I'm iterating over a range 0 to n, uh, hash n and my Fibonacci iterator. Oops, and I forgot to update the console output. Shoot. I'm sorry. I was editing my slides too late at night. The console output should have changed to say fib of 0 is 0, fib of 1 is 1, and so on and so forth. Um, I made a cut and paste error. Apologies. Uh, so anyway, that's zippered iteration across multiple things. 
Um, you also saw these ranges as I went. Uh, they're just useful for representing um, regular sequences of integers. So I've got one to n over on the left. On the right here, that zero to hash n is, is an instance of an arrange operator. What I'm actually saying is start from zero, count to infinity, but then give me only the first n elements of that range. So this is sort of a cute way of writing zero to n minus one, basically. Uh, you also see we've got tuples. So the result of a zippered iteration is a tuple of values, and I'm capturing that here in the tuple of variables i and f. We also use these to represent multidimensional array indices and to return multiple values from procedures. Um, so that's uh, kind of a, a short example of some of the base language features. There are a ton of other ones which I can't get into today due to time. Uh, we've got interoperability with C and MPI in particular, um, object-oriented programming, overloading, where clauses, yada, yada, yada. Sort of everything you'd like in a modern programming language, hopefully. All right, so that's the base language. Uh, moving on, uh, let's look at some of the parallelism. We have two styles of parallelism in Chapel. There's the lower level task parallelism, which I'll talk about next, and then there's higher level data parallelism. And for us, task parallelism is saying like, create a task to do this, create another task to do that. And data parallelism more like, for all the elements in my array or for all the indices in this space, you know, do something. Uh, so for task parallelism, there are three different ways to create tasks. We'll see two of them today. The simplest one is just to tack this begin keyword onto the front of a statement. And this says, create a task to execute that statement while the original task just continues executing. So here I'm saying, create a task to print out hello world. The original task will keep running and it'll print out goodbye. I haven't done anything to coordinate or synchronize between these tasks, so they could execute in either order. And I may see hello world goodbye, or I may see goodbye hello world, depending. Uh, one of the things I won't see is the inner splicing of like H E G O L L, you know, where the messages get mixed together. And that's because our write line routine is basically thread safe, task safe. All right, so that's the simplest way to create tasks. And that gives you a really sort of unstructured way to create what we call fire and forget tasks, just create things to go off and run things. Um, we also have more structured ways of creating tasks. One of them uh, that we use a lot is this coforall loop. It's a lot like the serial for loop we saw from before. But what a coforall says is create a distinct task for every iteration of the loop. So if I have four iterations, I'm going to end up with four tasks, each one of which is going to execute one iteration of that loop body. And here I'm just using it to write another little hello world message, um, you know, hello from task three out of four kind of thing. Um, and one of the things about the coforall, unlike the begin, is that because it's this structured thing, when you get to the end of the coforall loop, you wait until all the tasks you've created from that loop complete before you go on. Uh, so again, because I haven't coordinated between these tasks, the output between them may come out in any order. You know, two shows up here before zero, for example. Um, but that all tasks done message won't print until all the tasks have print out their messages because of that implicit join at the end of a coforall. All right. So those are, again, two of the three ways of creating tasks. The third one is basically just a compound statement. In the interest of time, I'm skipping past it. Um, and the one other thing I wanted to say about task parallelism is, uh, in my simple examples, I just create tasks that print out things. But of course, in real programs, tasks often need to coordinate with one another. And the two ways in which tasks can coordinate with one another in Chapel is through atomic variables, which are a lot like the atomics in C and C++. Um, and then we have sync variables, which are maybe a little bit more unusual. Um, sync variables are basically like normal variables, but they store a full empty bit along with their state. So like a synchronized integer would store an integer value and then this full empty bit. And so reads on sync variables block until that full empty bit is full and then leave it empty. And writes block until it's empty and leave it full. So it gives you kind of a way of doing a producer and consumer style synchronization between tasks. Um, and it makes it really easy to write a bounded buffer, uh, for example. All right, so that's how our tasks coordinate with one another and share data. Um, this is sort of a laundry list of other task parallel concepts. Uh, the co-begins are the third way of creating tasks that I mentioned. Um, single variables are a variant of those full empty variables I mentioned. And then we have a few statements that are used to squash parallelism or to synchronize between tasks. Um, so that's the low level way to create parallelism in Chapel. OK, so next we're going to talk about locality control. And locality, again, is all about where should tasks run on the machine? Where should data be stored on the machine? Um, and you can imagine, in general, you're going to want to have some sort of affinity between your tasks and your data. And so locality is all about that. And the key feature for locality in Chapel is this type that we call the locale. Uh, probably a little circular there. Um, for all intents and purposes, think of a locale as a compute node, right? So you're running on some large machine. Think of each compute node as being a locale. 
Uh, we support these so you can think about sort of here versus there. If two things are on the same locale, it's going to be fairly cheap for them to coordinate or communicate with one another. If they're on different locales, it's going to be more expensive because you're going across a network, right? And that's the whole point of the locale concept. Um, when you run a chapel program, you specify the number of locales on the command line. So here I've shown the long and short forms of saying I'd like to run on eight locales. And again, what that means is uh, go out and give me eight compute nodes and get my program spun up and running on those eight compute nodes. Within the text of your program, there are a few built-in variables that you can use to refer to the locales in which you're running. Um, num locales, which is just an integer saying how many locales you're running on. And then more importantly, this locales array, uh, which again is going to be this array of type locale, which basically has a one-to-one -one correspondence between the compute nodes on which you're running and this abstract locale type that's built into the language. Right? So you basically have a first-class way of referring to the machine resources that your program's running on within the text of the program itself. And we'll see why in a few more slides. So one other thing you need to know on this slide is when you start running your chapel program, we're not an SPMD model like uh, MPI or if you've used UPC or Coray Fortran, any of those. Um, chapel programs start logically as your main procedure is uh, running as a single task on locale zero. And then if you want to use other locales, then you have to use concepts to spread your, your computation out to those locales. All right, we'll see those in just a sec. So with these locales, what can you do? One of the things you can do is you can introspect about the machine on which you're running. So given a locale value, you can say things like, how much memory does this locale have? Or how many compute uh, cores does it have? Or what's its ID or its name or things like that? So anything you want to know about the machine you're running on, you would do through this locale interface. And then the other thing we use it for is, again, to move computation around. Uh, so the on clause is the primary way of, of migrating computation across the machine. Again, my program here is going to start running conceptually from locale zero. So that first write line is from locale zero. And then you see this on clause that says on locales one. So I'm indexing into that locales array. I'm going to the next locale. And that basically migrates my task over to that locale logically. And that next write line is going to be printed from locale number one. And then when I leave the context of that on clause, I basically pop back to the original locale. So that third write line is going to take place on locale zero. All right. So again, this is a way of moving the computation around the distributed memory machine. And this is sort of a, a silly and artificial example. In practice, you wouldn't normally say, like, run on locale 13, for example. And of course, there's brittleness in doing that, because then if you run on fewer than 13 locales, you'll get an out-of-bounds error on this, on this array access. Um, so typically, what you're going to do instead is use more of a data-driven style of on clause. So if you put any expression after the on clause, it'll say, go run wherever this expression is. So for example, if I index into an array, a sub ij, the on clause says, well, wherever that element I, a sub ij is, go over there and run this big computation. It's, it's expensive, and I want to run it near that element. Or if you're searching a graph or a tree, and you say something like, well, let's go wherever the left child of my node is. Go over to that locale and continue searching there, something like that. Right? So by doing these data-driven uh, on clauses, you're sort of independent of the number of locales, as long as you've spread out your data intelligently across locales. And we'll see how you do that as we go on. Um, you're basically saying, like, just go wherever that variable is. Like, that's where I want to be for this task. All right, so something that um, I, I hope is obvious, but I think it often isn't because uh, we don't see it in many of the programming models we use typically in HPC, is that in Chapel, parallelism and locality are completely separate concepts in language. Right, so this, this cofrol loop, like the one I showed you earlier, this is a parallel construct. It creates parallelism, it creates tasks, but it's a completely local program. Nothing about it says, you know, run anywhere other than here. So by default, all those tasks are going to be running on the same locale that the original task was. All right. Similarly, if we have a, a code that uses on clauses, uh, like the one we saw before, that's going to move a task around the machine, uh, but it's a completely serial program, right? There's no parallelism here. It's like, I'm printing something here, then I'm going over there and printing something there, going over there and printing something over there. Um, and uh, of course, the idea is that you can then uh, mix these things together. So I can say, let's create a cofrol, and then let's use an on clause within there so that each task goes to a different node, and then we have um, both parallelism and distribution at the same time. And again, I think this is key because if you think about it, sort of parallelism, again, what should run simultaneously, and locality, where should things execute, are really orthogonal context, uh, constructs. And I think it's unfortunate that the SPMD model has sort of put us into a world where you're sort of used to the only way of talking about parallelism is to create another image of your program, and that's also your unit of locality. The two things are just kind of bound together. Unless you start mixing in open MP or P threads, but then of course you get down to this, like mixing stuff together again, which is what we're trying to avoid. Okay, so in Chapel we said, these are two separate things, let's use two different sets of language features to address them. 
All right, so I mentioned something about uh, you know, go where the data is and somehow you get the data somewhere else. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, as you declare variables in Chapel, they will be allocated within the memory of the locale on which your task is running. So again, if my program starts running from locale zero and I declare a, an integer i, that's gonna be allocated in locale zero's memory, as you can see in the picture at the bottom. Uh, then if I use an on clause to go over to locale one and I declare another variable j, I'm gonna allocate that in locale one's memory because of course that's where the task is running now. And then I can use this coforall on idiom, uh, coforall loc and locales, create a task per locale, and then move each task to its respective locale. So now I've kind of created an SPMD loop essentially within my chapel program. And then if I say something like, give me a variable k that's an integer, each one of those tasks of course is, uh, is uh, seeing this declaration and um, allocating its own k, so I end up with a copy of k per locale where each task will refer to its own copy um, because that's the only one it can see lexically speaking. So then within this loop I can do things like k equals two times i plus j. And of course I'm still within the coforall, so each task is gonna be executing this on each locale. Um, and the point here is that uh, even though, so looking at, at locale three for example, its task is gonna run k equals two times i plus j. Of course i and j are remote, uh, but it's okay to access them even though they're not on your locale. So Chapel is part of this family of what's called PGAS languages. I don't think anyone's lectured on those yet this week, but maybe you've heard about them uh, back home. Um, the idea is if you can name a variable, if you can refer to it uh, here through lexical scoping, then you can access it whether it's local or remote. And the idea is that uh, it's gonna be the compiler and the runtime that implement that communication for you. So in this case, uh, because locale three, and in fact all locales are referring to i and j, um, the compiler and runtime are gonna have to make sure that copies of i and j are brought into locale 3's memory so we can actually do that operation. Uh, and in practice that's either done uh, sort of in a demand driven way by going and getting the value at the time it's needed um, or uh, it can be done more optimally. In this case in fact i and j would be forwarded as we created those tasks and spread them out across locales. We'd sort of send copies of i and j along with them uh, to avoid the communication back. All right. Uh, but again, the main point here is if you can see something in your lexical scope, which if you're not a big programming language person, just means if you can sort of see it looking up the scopes of your program like you normally would in C, then you can refer to it regardless of whether it's local to your locale or not. And that's both a great convenience because you can name any, uh, you can access anything you can name. And it's also a potential big performance problem because if you're not careful, you could always be referring to things that are remote and just chalking up a lot of communication. Um, before I go on, there are two other things I wanna, I wanna say about locality. Uh, so one of them is there's a built-in keyword called here, which basically uh, evaluates the locale on which the current task is running. So that's a way if you just sort of lose track of where your locale is and you just want to, or where your task is running and you wanna say, well, where am I on the machine? You can use here to say, um, you know, which locale am I running on? And the other thing you can do is given any variable, uh, you can say, which locale does this variable live on just by uh, applying the dot locale method to it. And using that, you can say stuff like, if here equals j.locale, then I'll do one thing, and otherwise maybe I'll do something else. All right? Um, so uh, I mentioned that uh, you don't see the communication in chapel programs, what we call implicit communication. You just refer to things and the communication happens. And again, that's a double-edged sword. Um, the nice thing about chapel is uh, the semantic model is very explicit about where data is placed and where tasks execute, right? So we don't sort of move things around on you magically under the covers. We don't really trust compilers, runtimes to do that very well. Uh, so you know, if you understand these rules I've given you, you should know exactly where all your data is and exactly where all your tasks are. Um, and that's, I think, an important property in a programming language. Um, the second thing, of course, is if you don't want to reason through it all, you can use these execution time queries that I mentioned to sort of figure out like, well, where is this task or um, where is this data? Uh, and the third thing, of course, is that I think tools are an important part of the story here as well. And we have a tool called ChapelViz, for example, that you can bracket a section of code, for example, and see things like, what communications am I doing here? Or what tasks am I creating? And so, if, you know, again, if you don't want to reason through it with a semantic model, uh, or you just don't understand kind of, it seems like there's you know, a big bottleneck here, what's going on? Tools like this uh, can help you figure that out, of course. All right, so that's your introduction to low-level Chapel. Um, again, the base language, the task parallel features, the locality features. And again, let me just pause and see if there are any questions, because you guys are so quiet, you're making me nervous. Although I see a lot of eyes on me, which is encouraging. Yeah? Can you have an array of synchronization variables? Yeah, so the question was, can you have an array of synchronization variables? And the answer is yes. So synchronization variables can be composed in array, as array elements or, 
um, fields of classes or records or things like that as well. And in fact, I mentioned briefly, you know, it's a great uh, tool for bounded buffer types of problems. The way we actually do that is we create an array of synchronization variables. And all these kind of error cases you normally have to deal with manually in bounded buffer, like is my producer uh, uh, you know, so far ahead that it's wrapping around on itself, or is my consumer kind of trying to consume things that aren't produced yet? The full empty bits make all that just kind of go away. It's like it works really, really well. Uh, so that's actually a very common idiom is uh, an array of synchronization variables, yeah. Other questions? Yes. Uh, so what would happen if, uh, if I generate the um, a a variable on two different uh, locales and then would try to access it? Um, you mean a variable with the same name on two different locales? OK, so let's go back up to the slide that did that. So here, for example, you could argue that I have uh, five variables named k. And so you know, do we get confused about it? And this is a really common question. In fact, I think I get asked this almost every year, which maybe means I'm not explaining it well. But um, the key thing to realize here is if you don't think about the picture too hard, if you just looked at the code, and in fact, if you even ignored like, the, the constructs you weren't familiar with, think of the co for all as a for loop and ignore the on clause. Um, you know, normally, if you were in a C code, you wouldn't say, like, how do I refer to the other iteration's copy of k? You would sort of just look at that and say, like, oh, well, every iteration has its own copy of k. I can only refer to the one that I can see in my lexical scope. You know, end of story. And it's the same thing here. Even though we have parallelism and there are multiple tasks executing at the same time, each one only knows about one k, which is the k in its lexical scope. The only way I can know about your k would be for me to see it. And again, the way that might happen is, for example, I can see i and I can see j because they're in my lexical scope but happen to be somewhere else. So the only way you'd be able to see it is if there were kind of two declarations of k in your lexical scoping. But if that happened, then normal shadowing rules occur, and it's only the innermost one you would see. So it really isn't a problem. And more than that, I would say it's completely intuitive. Like what you would expect to happen happens, and you don't run into those kind of challenges. Uh, was there a question over here as well? I was trying to ask about the problem. So if you are, if you are launching a powerful like call for all uh -huh. on one local, yep. you're assuming that multiple cores are doing their share, their share of the work, right? Multiple cores are being used, yeah. So typically what happens with the, uh, so the question was kind of, or I think where you're going is kind of, what, how are these co actually implemented, or how are they mapped down to the system essentially? Is that right? Yeah, so um, what our language defines is tasks. And tasks are, again, these units of, of parallel computation. And then typically what we're doing is mapping those down to threads. And the threads we map them down to, there are actually a number of options available to you. Um, so one model, for example, is that each task runs on its own p-thread. And so if you had as many tasks as there were cores and your operating system spread out the p-threads well, you'd end up using all the cores locally. Um, another model we use is to use a lot of uh, user-level tasking, where we uh, switch between tasks uh, within a p-thread, and that has lower overhead. We can also get better locality benefits. So in that model, we're, we're still running on, on POSIX threads, but we're doing sort of user-level multiplexing of the tasks across those threads. Um, and those are different options that are available in the chapel runtime. The language actually says very little about how tasks are mapped to the machine. So to get the full story, like if you really wanted to understand exactly how these tasks were going down to the machine, you have to sort of think about, well, which one of these tasking implementations am I using, and what kind of semantics does it guarantee? Um, and I guess you are having your own compiler, right? Yes, so we have a, a custom compiler for Chapel. It, maps, it actually compiles down to C, and then we have runtime libraries that provide things like the tasking and the communication. So we've architected it so that, for example, let's say you had your own tasking library that you thought did a much better job than pthreads or the ones we're using. Um, the runtime is architected so that you could plug your own tasking library in there uh, and, and um, basically you have to say things like, well, how do I create a new task, and how do I synchronize between tasks and things like that. But what about uh, uh, if, if Intel compiler introduced some new features, are you going to benefit from that there? Sorry, if which compiler introduced new features? For example, if Intel compiler, let's say, it, it, it introduces oh. vectorization, okay. and are, are you going to benefit from there? Yeah, so the question was, if, if the back-end compiler, like the Intel compiler, introduces new features, will we benefit? So typically, we do source, source compilation, so we generate C code. And to the extent that the back-end compiler can optimize our generated C code, um, then we will benefit from those things. Um, we also help the back-end compiler sometimes, so we often emit into our code things like, oh, we know that this loop is vectorizable. Please help vectorize it for us, and things like that. Um, all right, so we're going to pop next to uh, the higher-level features of Chapel. 
And uh, this is data parallelism and these domain maps, which I, I'll define as we go. Uh, so in data parallelism, I'm again going to do this by example. And I'm going to go back to that stream triad computation I showed you at the beginning so that um, now you know enough to, to kind of see uh, all of these features. So the first thing I'm declaring here is something that we call a domain. A domain is kind of a unique feature in Chapel. It's basically a first class language concept that represents an index set. And so here it represents the indices 1 through m. And I've drawn a picture here that makes it look like I've basically declared an array. But it's crucial to understand that this isn't really an array. It's just like the indices that you might use to create an array or that you might use to uh, drive a loop iteration or something like that. Um, so one of the things we use these domains for is we use them to declare arrays. So here I'm saying, give me three arrays, a, b, and c. The square brackets say this is an array. And problem space says, uh, you know, create this array such that it spans all of the indices defined by this domain, uh, so 1 to m. And then real says, of course, uh, every element of the array should be a real floating point variable. So now I've basically changed that. Uh, I've, I've, you can think of it as instantiation, right? I've taken that domain template, and I've created three arrays that share that index set. Uh, so now we can use uh, the key uh, control feature in, in the data parallel section, which is a for all loop. And a for all loop, like a co-for-all, is parallel. Uh, but unlike a co-for-all, it doesn't say literally create a task for every iteration. What a for-all basically says is create some tasks, uh, do this uh, uh, execution in parallel, and sort of use an appropriate amount of parallelism, where appropriate amount typically is sort of proportional to the number of cores uh, on which you're executing, right? So if you're on a four-core system, uh, you know, use four tasks to, to do this loop. And I'll get more into that in a bit. Um, you see also I'm using the zippered iteration here. So I'm saying do a parallel zippered iteration across these three arrays, doing the, the scale add um, across the elements as I go. Um, uh, there's one other way I could write this, uh, which is slightly nicer. I can use whole array operations in Chapel and actually just say array A equals array B plus alpha times array C. And this is semantically equivalent to that zippered for all. This is just a arguably slightly nicer way of writing it. Um, so this gives you actually a lot of the core data parallel features in the, in the language, domains, arrays, and for all loops. Um, there are a bunch of others that I never have time to get through. The data parallel section is one of the bigger sections of the language. But just to give you a quick survey of what's there, um, in this example I just showed you, I'm only using simple one-dimensional arrays. Chapel has a really rich set of array types, including multi-dimensional arrays, strided arrays, sparse arrays, and associative arrays, which give you like a hash table or a dictionary-like concept. Um, so my slides, I won't get into many of those today. Uh, but it's important that you know that there's sort of this rich array computation fabric out there. Um, we have array slicing, which is a way of referring to a subarray using ranges or domains. So here, for example, I'm saying, you know, give me a subset of A's elements, either defined by these ranges that I've inlined there, or maybe I've declared a domain called elements of interest, which stores all of the indices that I care about. Uh, and just to give you a sense of how rich this can be, let's say elements of interest was one of these sparse domains and A was a dense array. You could, for example, set up a sparse set of indices and say, well, let me refer to just these elements of the array that these indices correspond to and do it with this really compact expression. Um, we have promotion, which is the idea of taking a function that was designed for scalar arguments and passing array arguments in. And that gives you the equivalent of doing a for all loop uh, over that function call, essentially. And then we have reductions and scans. Um, you know, I think you've heard about reductions probably in every programming model you've heard about this week. We've got them as well. You can also write user-defined reductions. So if you're kind of coming from a MapReduce kind of world, uh, you could write your own uh, reduce operators, basically. Um, so that's data parallelism in a nutshell. Again, kind of a quick guide. But we'll actually do more data parallelism in this next section. So let's talk about domain maps. And domain maps are all about uh, how do we map these domains and arrays and data parallel computations down to the system. So given the stream triad, as I've shown it to you so far, uh, again, it's a completely smart question to say, well, how does this actually run on a system? And the answer here is that I haven't said anything about how this domain is implemented. And so like all other variables in Chapel, it's going to default to being allocated on the current locale that my task is running on. And what that means is that uh, those arrays are all going to be local to my locale, and the for all loop uh, is going to use only resources local to that locale. So if I'm running on a four core uh, compute node, for example, I'm going to end up with these arrays locally in memory. And when I hit that for all loop, I'm going to create four tasks, each one of which is going to do a quarter of the work. OK? Um, now, this gets back to kind of the teaser I gave at the beginning of the talk. I can throw this demapped clause onto my domain. And this says, how do you want to map that domain and its arrays and loops over it down to the architecture? And here I'm filling in that expression I left out earlier. And I'm saying, let's map it down in a cyclic manner using a start index of 1. 
And what that's going to do is it's going to take sort of the entire 1D index space, which I've thrown up here on the top of my slide. It's going to take that first uh, start index that I passed it, and it's going to start dealing things out round robin, starting with locale 0 at that index. And so uh, what I essentially get is a cyclic partitioning of the entire 1D index space, which implies a cyclic partitioning of my domain, which implies a cyclic partitioning of my arrays over that domain, which implies a cyclic partitioning of the work when I do the for all loop at the bottom. Uh, and I should mention, even though I, I don't have a good way of drawing it here, so uh, basically each compute node now owns a fraction of the work. And it's not only going to be doing its fraction of the computation, it's also going to be using multi-core parallelism to get the, uh, the shared memory parallelism within each compute node. So this is sort of hybrid parallelism uh, both across compute nodes and within compute nodes. Now, if I decide that cyclic really isn't the right thing for my problem, uh, as it actually isn't for this because you really would like to take advantage of some locality here, I can then swap in a different domain map, like uh, in this case I'm using the block domain map. The block domain map is characterized by a bounding box, and we're going to partition that bounding box up across the processors. So we partition it up. That implies a partitioning of the domain, which implies a partitioning of the arrays and of the loop. And so again, I end up with this hybrid where I now have uh, distributed memory parallelism at a coarse grain, and then each one of those uh, locales is going to also use fine grain parallelism within itself uh, to distribute the, the local elements it owns. OK? So this takes us back, actually, to the beginning of the talk, where I sort of said, look at this nice short code. If I just change that one clause, I could end up with very different implementations of it. Um, and so now you've seen an example of that, and I've seen enough language to kind of have a sense of how that works. Um, just to kind of build on this very simple example, again, we have a number of different array and domain types, and each one of these can be distributed across locales. Uh, so like up here in the upper right, I've got this uh, sparse domain and sparse array. You could use some sort of recursive bisection to distribute that across locales, for example. And again, computationally, you would, you would operate on it just like you would any other array. So let me show an example in a real code. Uh, this is Lulesh. This is one of the DOE proxy applications. And it's one of the early proxy applications we studied in Chapel. Um, this is the Chapel version of it. And as you can see, it's amazingly elegant and clear. Um, you, know, you guys understand probably every line of this code now. Um, OK, so I'm, I'm obviously joking. Uh, so what I can say at a high level is that uh, it's, a, it's a reasonably compact code. It's about a fourth of the size of the C plus MPI plus OpenMP reference version. And in fact, ours is a little bit more capable in some ways. But here's the more important thing. Um, our code supports uh, really drastic decisions about things like, do we want to use a structured or unstructured mesh for this computation? Do we want to do this locally or in a distributed manner? Do we want to use sparse or dense arrays to represent our materials? And all of those choices are implemented using the very small number of yellow lines of code that I've highlighted here. And that's because of these domain maps. We can make these very um, important decisions about data structures and how to map them to the architecture in a very small number of lines of code. And all the rest of the code is basically physics. Uh, and so you know, we talked earlier about application scientists want to just get their science done, don't want to mess around with the machine a lot. Um, to me, this is sort of a good indication of how we think Chapel helps here, is by sort of making the decisions about how to map to the machine restricted to a small amount of the code, uh, we can keep a lot of the algorithm very independent of those decisions. And again, domain maps are the key here. So if these domain maps aren't clear to you, essentially what they are are these recipes where conceptually in our minds we have this high-level global view of a computation, like for all elements in these vectors, do the multiply, add, assign. Um, and the domain maps essentially say, how do I take that high-level um, uh, computation and map it down to the distributed memories and the multiple cores that I actually have on real systems. Um, so there are three key things to know about domain maps. One is that when you download Chapel, there's a library of domain maps that comes with it, things like the block and the cyclic that you've seen here. The second one is that uh, end users like yourselves can actually write your own domain maps in Chapel. Um, that's not to say it's easy, but it's possible. So um, if, for example, you're like, well, my computation wants a very specific kind, you know, we've developed this heuristic way of distributing our data, um, and you haven't anticipated that. It's not in your library. Um, you could write your own domain map, dmap your arrays using your distribution, and uh, in fact, you could contribute dmap back to the code base then, and others could benefit from it as well. And the third thing here to know is that all of the things in bullet one, all of the standard domain maps we provide are written using the same framework that you would use as an end user. And we've done this to kind of eat our own dog food and make sure we don't set up a performance cliff where built-in things work well and user-defined things work terribly. Um, you could argue we've made everything work terribly, uh, but we've basically been working to make everything work better and better and better over time. <laughs>
All right, so that's domain maps. Um, I'm just going to mention in passing, there are two other very thematically similar features in the language. You can define your own parallel iterators. So I was making some statements about this is how the for all loop would be mapped down to the architecture. Again, if that didn't make sense for your computation, you can define your own ways of implementing for all loops and saying how, to, how many tasks to create, where those tasks should run, how to distribute the iterations across the tasks. You can also define your own locale models, which is basically um, an abstract representation of the target machine. What is the architecture I'm mapping to? How do I map tasks and memory and communication down to that? So if you developed a new architecture that we'd never seen before and you weren't willing to work with us on it, uh, you could define your own locale model and basically get Chapel running on it, um, again, by writing Chapel code uh, without going into modifying the compiler. Um, so that is, in a sense, at the beginning I said Chapel's extensible. That's what I'm saying, right? You can write your own array implementations, your own parallel iterators, your own architectural models, and we think this is crucial in the language to be future-proof, right? The problem we keep having is architectures change, and then we have to develop new program models, or our program models have to change. Um, with Chapel, we've tr tried to des design something where, again, top down, parallelism and locality, what matter? How do you map it to the machine? And then allow people to map to the machine and to any machine any way they want to, right? That's the vision here. Uh, so to summarize the language, I think HPC programmers, you guys and me, deserve better programming models. I think that higher level programming models like Chapel can really help insulate algorithms from parallel implementation details, as we saw in the Lulash example, um, and yet in a way that doesn't abdicate control. You're not just saying trust the compiler or the runtime to do magical things. You can still reason about every step of the way because it's all built within Chapel. It's all built on these same building blocks. And we think as a result of this, Chapel can greatly improve productivity, um, both for current and emerging HPC architectures, but also for people outside of HPC, uh, mainstream, maybe hobbyist programmers, um, data analysts, um, anybody who cares about parallel programming at scale. And so Chapel is portable. A lot of people, when they hear about Chapel, they assume it's Cray specific. Uh, Cray definitely is leading the implementation and the design, um, but we're doing it in a way that is designed to be very, very portable. So in the implementation, to run, you need a C and C++ compiler, a Unix-style environment, POSIX threads, and some way of communicating, which could be RDMA, MPI, UDP, basically things you've got on almost any system you've ever run on. And as a result of this, Chapel can run on laptops and workstations, uh, commodity clusters, the cloud, Cray systems, those from our competitors, um, and modern processors like Intel Xeon Phi, GPUs, things like that. It's open source, so all the development's being done at GitHub. It's licensed as Apache 2.0. Uh, there's instructions for downloading and installing it. Um, this is the picture of the Chapel team at Cray. There are currently 14 full-time employees working on Chapel. This summer, we've also got three visitors. Um, it's a collaborative effort, so we have a number of colleagues in academia, national labs, industry, who are also working on Chapel-related projects. And it's a work in progress. And, um, you know, if you, if you had for like one hour you want to devote to Chapel after this, and you're coming from user perspective, uh, click up this keynote from our workshop uh, that happened a couple months ago. This is an astrophysicist at Yale who's been looking at Chapel over a number of years. And kind of in this past year, we've gone from being too interesting to something he can actually use for his science. And so he gave a great keynote when he talked about um, what is the value he sees in Chapel, and uh, how does he think it's going to help him with his research going forward? Again, that's on our YouTube channel. Um, here's some resources to know for after today. So we've got our main project page at chapel.cray.com, our GitHub repo. We've also got Facebook and Twitter feeds if you do either one of those. If you want to read one 30-page summary of Chapel or give it to someone else to read, uh, kind of more or less what you've heard in this talk and a little bit more, um, I don't know if anyone else talked about this book. It's a really great book that uh, Pavan uh, edited that came out last year. And the Chapel chapter in here is kind of my recommended starting point as a reading. Uh, it's also available online if you are not interested in buying the book. If you don't even have time to read 30 pages anymore, or you've got a manager who doesn't, uh, here are some blog articles that'll give them just a flavor in about a thousand words. And this is a list of our mailing lists. Um, all these slides are available online. So maybe do I have one question to wrap it up? Yeah, back here. Uh, just one more comment. So uh, would you comment on the tools that you use for Chapel? Tools, yeah. So the question was, kind of what's the state of tools for Chapel? And the unfortunate reality is we don't have very many today. Um, the Chapel Viz tool that I showed is the main one that's Chapel specific. Because we generate C code, um, if you're a little bit brave, uh, you can use standard C tools on the generated Chapel code. How easy or hard that is depends on what kind of Chapel code you're writing and, and how brave you are, because our compiler messes things up a lot along the way. Um, so we're in this sort of interesting chicken and egg thing where tools people are like, well, I'd like to develop tools for Chapel, but I want to know it's going to be successful. And users are like, well, I want to use Chapel, but I want tools for it. And we're kind of in a deadlock. So we're trying to figure out how to get out of that deadlock. Um, and Chapel Viz is our first step to kind of offering up a first tool. Um, 
but yeah, I'd, I'd love to see lots more tools here, particularly a debugger. Can I write a chapel program for my for my node and communicate with other chapel programs on other nodes using MPI? Yeah, so I mentioned very briefly that we uh, have interoperability, and, and we think interoperability is key for our success and the success of any new language. Um, because if you can't work with old code, you're sort of creating an island for yourself, right? Uh, so we interoperate with C a lot, and we wrap a lot of libraries that way. And just in the last few months, uh, we've started interoperating with MPI. And there are two ways you can do this. You can either write a chapel node code that's like a shared memory code and use MPI between them, uh, just as you would normally use, uh, say, C plus MPI, or sorry, C and OpenMP plus MPI. So chapel could replace that C plus OpenMP piece. Uh, but you can also run chapel in a mode where you run chapel across the multiple compute nodes or locales. So you're in this distributed memory chapel world. You can use the PGAS address space. You can refer to things wherever they are. But then you can also pass messages between your locales. And this, I think, it will be useful, um, particularly as we're still working on performance issues, which we are. I didn't say much about that. Um, if there's sort of a 10% of your code that you really care about the performance, you can imagine, for example, relying on all of Chapel's nice global address space everywhere else, and then in that code kind of lock it down and say, I'm only going to refer to local things. I'm going to do all the message passing myself to make sure that the compiler doesn't introduce any unnecessary communication. Um, and so that's something that uh, the user, the Yale user I mentioned, Nikhil, um, he's been, uh, actually, he developed this MPI mode, and he's been using that in his own work um, to sort of do this sort of 10% performance tuning, 90% productivity kind of thing.